Hi everyone, it's Michael Shermer. This is a special edition of the Michael Shermer Show. Unfortunately, I have to post this on uh, Thursday, February 24th, shortly after uh, Putin invaded Ukraine. This will be an audio edition of my Substack Skeptic column, which I posted yesterday, called Putin's Problem. So I'm going to read what I wrote yesterday, which is still quite relevant today, unfortunately. Um, and I'll make a few comments as I'm reading this just after President Biden gave his speech about upping the number of sanctions that uh, we and the EU and the UN and our allies are going to impose on Putin and Russia. The subtitle of this column, Putin's Problem, is The Outlawry of War Has Forced Tyrants to Concoct Excuses for Invading Other Countries. How Should We Respond? Evidence shows that outcasting in the form of economic sanctions beats armed conflict. After amassing nearly 200,000 troops and war materiel along the Ukrainian border and coastline the past few weeks, itself a follow-up to the 2014 annexation of Crimea, the former KGB officer and now president for life, Vladimir Putin, on Monday, February 21st, officially announced his recognition of the independence of two separatist groups in the eastern regions of that sovereign nation. They are the Donetsk People's Republic and the Yuhansk People's Republic, not to be confused with the People's Republic of Donetsk and the People's Republic of Luhansk. U.S. intelligence announced that Putin was planning on staging false flag operations as an excuse to launch a full-scale defense by his police forces of these poor beleaguered peoples being threatened by the West. And uh, this morning, that's exactly what he did and announced that's what he was going to do last night. The Russian dissident and former world chess champion Garry Kasparov recognized the ploy immediately and tweeted an old Soviet joke regarding Nazi forces massing on the Czechoslovakian border in 1938. Why are there so many troops? In case of provocation. What if there is no provocation? How could there not be with so many troops? You can see the visuals in the print uh, version of this uh, podcast if you go to michaelshermer.substack.com, along with the other images and uh, visuals I present here. It would be as if Mexico amassed troops along the U.S. southern border, then recognized the independence of the Tucson People's Republic and the El Paso People's Republic, followed by an invasion to protect those separatists' territorial sovereignty against the encroaching states of Arizona and Texas engulfing them. It's a cockamamie ruse only an Alex Jones-level conspiracist would believe. And everyone in the West knows it. And Putin knows that we know it. And we know that Putin knows that we know it. So what is going on here? Why did the Russian autocrat feel the need to concoct such a pretense to war? The proximate answer involves geopolitics, the relationship of NATO and the West with Russia, the consequences of the fall of the Soviet Union, economic leverage, greed, and whatever else drives dictators to want to color in more of the map in their country's hue. Putin and his oligarch billionaire buddies, in conjunction with the state coffers they control, could easily just buy whatever it is they want from Ukraine, using the same method most other countries use, trade. But apparently Putin would rather be the seller than the buyer. And the revanchism that has driven autocrats from time immemorial has parasitized Putin's brain, giving him, driving him to abandon any such utilitarian calculations. The ultimate answer for Putin's pretense is that ever since war was outlawed in 1928, despots have felt the need to justify their pugnaciousness. In their 2017 book of How This Happened and Why, The Internationalists, How a Radical Plan to Outlaw War Remade the World, Yale University legal scholars 
Una Hathaway, and Scott Shapiro. Begin with the contorted legal machinations of lawyers, legislators, and politicians in the 17th century that made war, in the words of the Prussian military theorist Karl von Clausewitz, the continuation of politics by other means. Those means included a license to kill other people, take their stuff, and occupy their land. Legally. How did this happen? In 1625, the renowned Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius penned a 500-page legal justification for his country's capture of the Portuguese merchant ship Santa Catarina when those two countries were at war. The document was titled The Law of War and Peace, and it argued in short that if individuals have rights that can be defended through courts, the nations have rights that can be defended through war. Why? Because there was no world court to adjudicate disputes between nations. As a consequence, for four centuries, nations have felt at liberty to justify their bellicosity through war manifestos, legal documents outlining their just causes for just wars. Hathaway and Shapiro compiled over 400 such documents into a database on which they conducted a content analysis that is a catalog of reasons why nations said they had to fight. The most common rationalizations for war were self-defense, 69%, enforcing treaty obligations, 47%, compensation for tortious injuries, 42%, violations of the laws of war or law of nations, 35%, stopping those who would dispute the balance of power, 33%, and protection of trade interests, 19%. Those percentages obviously add up way over 100%. That's because they typically listed multiple reasons in these uh, statements justifying war. These war manifestos are, in short, an exercise in motivated reasoning employing the confirmation bias, the hindsight bias, the my side bias, and other cognitive heuristics to justify a predetermined end. Instead of, I came, I saw, I conquered, these declarations read more like, I was just standing there minding my own business when the other guy threatened me. I had to defend myself by attacking him preemptively. It's all his fault. The problem with this arrangement is obvious. Call it the moralization bias, the belief that our cause is moral and just, and anyone who disagrees is not just wrong, but immoral. In 1917, with the carnage of the First World War evident to even war enthusiasts, a Chicago corporate lawyer named Salman Levinson reasoned, quote, We should have, not as now, laws of war but laws against war. Just as there are no laws of murder or of poisoning, but laws against them. Close quote. With the support of the American philosopher John Dewey, the French foreign minister Aristide Briand, the German foreign minister Gustav Strassmann, and the U.S. Secretary of State Frank B. Kellogg, Levinson's dream of war outlawry came to fruition with the General Pact for the Renunciation of War, also known as the Peace Pact or the kellogg briand Pact, signed in Paris in 1928. War was outlawed. Stunning. Given the number of wars since 1928, not the least of which was the Second World War that exceeded the hemoclism of its predecessor by an order of magnitude, what happened? The moralization bias was in full flowering, of course, but there was also lack of enforcement. That began to change after the ruinous World War II, when the concept of outcasting took hold, the most common example being economic sanctions. Quote, instead of doing something to the rule breakers, Hathaway and Shapiro explained, noting that this usually involved attacking the offending nation, Outcasters refuse to do something with the rule breakers. 
Close quote. This principle of exclusion doesn't always work. Cuba and North Korea come to mind, but sometimes it does. Turkey and Iran, perhaps. And it is almost always better than war. The result, the researchers show, is that, quote, interstate war has declined precipitously and conquests have almost completely disappeared. Almost. Mm. That the outlawry of war has not eliminated war is no more reason to give up on outlawry than that we should eliminate laws against murder just because murder rates have not bottomed out at zero. Homicide rates have, in fact, dropped precipitously over the centuries, as have the frequency and destructiveness of international wars, interstate conflicts, and civil wars. So the system works, even if imperfectly. Why it works requires an understanding of what leads countries to become more or less belligerent. In their book, Triangulating Peace, Democracy, Interdependence, and International Organizations, the political scientists Bruce Russett and John O'Neill use a multiple logistic regression model on data from the Correlates of War Project that recorded 2,300 militarized interstate disputes between 1816 and 2001. Assigning each country a democracy score of between 1 and 10, based on the polity project that measures how competitive its political process is, how openly its leaders are chosen, how many constraints on a leader's power are in place, the transparency of the democratic process is, the fairness of its elections, etc. By the way, I'll note parenthetically, the United States used to be uh, about an 8 or 9 out of 10 on the polity project scale. We're now down to about a 6, I read recently. And my guest this week on the podcast, Barbara F. Walter, uh, explains all that in her book. I think Russia's probably in the negative uh, scale there. They've been uh, 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 not a democracy for, what, 20 years now that Putin is... Uh, appointed himself president for life. Anyway, continuing. Russett and O'Neill found that when two countries are fully democratic, that is, they score high on the polity scale, disputes between them decrease by 50%. But when one member of a country pair was either a low-scoring democracy or a full autocracy, which is what Russia is now, it doubled the chance of a quarrel between them. Hmm. When you add a market economy and international trade into the triangular equation, it decreases the likelihood of conflict between nations. Russett and O'Neill found that for every pair of at-risk nations, when they entered the amount of trade as a proportion of GDP, they found that countries that depended more on trade in a given year were less likely to have a militarized dispute in the subsequent year, controlling for democracy, power ratio, great power status, and economic growth. In general, the data show that liberal democracies with market economies are more prosperous, more peaceful, and fairer than any other form of governance and economic system. In particular, they found that democratic peace happens only when both members of a pair are democratic, but that trade works when either member of the pair has a market economy. In other words, trade is even more important than democracy, although the latter is important for other reasons as well. Finally, the third vertex of Russet and O'Neill's triangle of peace is membership in the international community, a proxy for transparency. Evil is more likely to thrive in secret. Openness and transparency make it harder for dictators and demigods to commit violence and genocide. To test this hypothesis, Russet and O'Neill counted the number of international governmental organizations, IGOs, that every pair of nations jointly belonged to and ran a regression analysis with democracy and trade scores, finding that overall democracy, trade, and membership in IGOs all favor peace, and that a pair of countries that are in the top tenth of the scale in all three variables are 83% less likely than an average pair of countries to have a militarized dispute in a given year. By the way, this, this shows why a continuous way of thinking rather than a binary way of thinking uh, is vastly superior in understanding causality, particularly in the social realm. It's not that democracy or trade or membership in international governmental organizations, or all three, 
Uh, 100% means you'll never go to war. No, that's not what it means. It, it's a scaling up. Think of it as a dimmer switch up and down, uh, depending on uh, those three variables and other factors. Continuing. Now back to Hathaway and Shapiro and how they use this research in their own uh, book. Using data from the Correlates of War Project to test their theory that the outlawry of war and the outcasting of bad actors works to reduce their nefarious influence, Hathaway and Shapiro found that between 1816 and 1928, there was on average approximately one conquest every 10 months. Wow. Or 1.21 conquests per year. Another way to conceptualize this is that during this period, a nation had a 1.33% chance of being conquered, which translates into states losing territory once in an ordinary human lifetime. And the average amount of real estate loss was substantial, 295,000 square kilometers. That's over 183,000 square miles every year. That's about 11 Crimeas per year for a century. That's a lot of land. By the way, by comparison, California is 163,000 square miles. Texas is 268,000 square miles. The span from 1929 to 1948, with World War II right smack in the middle, wasn't much better at 1.15 per year, one every 10 months, and an average loss of 240,000 square kilometers or 149,000 square miles. But everything changed after the Second World War when outcasting took effect, primarily through economic sanctions. And the average number of conquests per year fell to 0.26 per year, compared to, again, 1.15 per year. Or one every 3.9 years, as opposed to every year, with an average loss of only, of only 14,950 square kilometers per year. So, order of magnitude less uh, territory loss. From this data, Hathaway and Shapiro conclude, quote, the likelihood that any individual state would suffer a conquest in an average year plummeted from 1.33% a year to 0.17% from 1949 on. After 1948, the chance an average state would suffer a conquest fell from once in a lifetime to once or twice a millennium. Close quote. Thus, it is rational to conclude that the broad support from the UN, the EU, and U.S. allies, President Biden's sanctions against Russia in proportion to its military incursions into eastern Ukraine, is the right response. And now we see this morning, it's no longer just eastern Ukraine. They have invaded from all sides, and they appear to be hitting all the major cities in Ukraine. These sanctions include shutting down the Russia to Germany Nord Stream 2 pipeline to hurt the multi-billion dollar project of Russia's Gazprom energy company, freezing bank assets under US, U.S. jurisdiction of Russian oligarchs who have over $80 billion in investments, sanctions imposed on individuals listed on a specially designated nationals, SDN, and blocked persons list through the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, limit trade through sectoral sanctions applied to specific Russian firms in energy, finance, technology, and defense sectors as part of a sectoral sanctions identification list, and taking Russia out of the SWIFT financial system, which moves money from bank to bank around the globe, which will immediately damage Russia's economy. Okay, Biden outlined that a couple of days ago. And then in his speech this morning, he announced that they were, we, we have already uh, started doing that this morning. Again, it's not going to stop Putin this morning. These are long-term effects, as Biden emphasized. Predictably, Republicans called Biden's sanctions too little too late. Uh, but what's the alternative? You know, had we done this weeks ago, then Putin would have just uh, said, well, that's why I'm amassing my troops, because the West is doing this too. So the timing has to be right, and the timing was right. In any case, again, what's the alternative? U.S. troops on the ground in Ukraine for years or decades? Armed conflict that could escalate into a nuclear exchange? Something Putin has, Putin has publicly stated is not off the table. He said that uh, in 2014 uh, regarding the annexation of Crimea, and he just said that last night that it's not off the table. Hmm. 
Equally predictably, the former president of Trump Stakes, Trump Airlines, Trump University in the United States declared Putin's move, quote, genius on a right wing talk radio show, adding, quote, so Putin is now saying it's independent, a large section of Ukraine. And I said, how smart is that? He's going to go in and be a peacekeeper. We could use that on our southern border. That's the strongest peace force I've ever seen. There were more army tanks than I've ever seen. They're going to keep peace all right. Close quote from Mr. Trump. Unbelievable. No matter how unsatisfying a response such sanctions may seem against a bully like Putin, we have merely to recall the devastation of the Second World War or the massive costs of the U.S. United States' two-decade involvement in two Middle Eastern wars and compute the cost-benefit ratio. Outcasting is better than armed conflict. Putin's problem is that he's a tyrant out of time, a 19th century potentate in a 21st century world that, hopefully, will not tolerate his revanchist aspirations. So let us heed the words of the historian John Emmerich Edward Dahlberg Acton, better known as Lord Acton, who penned this observation in an 1887 letter, quote, Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Close quote. Putin is a bad man whose absolute power over Russia has corrupted him absolutely. We must not let us let it corrupt us. Okay, well, we'll see what happens. Of course, I don't know. Nobody knows what he's going to do. The sanctions are the right thing to do. Um, it could take months, could take years. Uh, if he topples the current government in Ukraine and replaces it with his lackeys, that's going to be harder to do anything legally, democratically to uh, get Ukraine back its sovereign status among nations. Whether it could escalate to armed conflict or whether he would, between the West uh, and Russian forces, much less escalate to a nuclear uh, exchange, I don't think so. Um, just from what I know, I think he wants to cobble together the old USSR uh, and stop there. And NATO will, of course, not let him go any further than that. In any case, I suspect that's what's going to happen. So the question is, is do we want to let him uh, get away with taking Ukraine? Of course, he won't stop there. There's uh, all the other uh, states that uh, are former um, parts of the Soviet Union uh, that are now independent nations, and I'm sure he wants those back as well. So depending on what we do here, we'll either give him encouragement to go further or stop. Hopefully he'll stop, but it remains to be seen. Again, I don't know, and nobody knows. All right, thanks for listening, and if you appreciate the podcast and our work here at the Skeptics, please go to skeptic.com slash donate, or go to michaelshermer.substack.com, and you can uh, subscribe to my weekly Skeptic column there. All right, thanks for listening.